Welcome to the Orion X Download, where we talk about big ideas and technology. Hello again, I'm Dan Olds, and we're here with another edition of the Orion X Download. Uh, with me are Shaheen Khan and Steve Perrino, both from Orion. Say hi, guys. How you doing? Hey, hi, Dan. You? Great to be here. Great to have uh, all three of us together. Our topic today is going to be very complex. So we're going to take uh, probably two or three shows to cover this. We'll take as many shows as it as it takes to cover it because that's our commitment to you, the listener. What we're going to be talking about is blockchain and Bitcoin, how they interact, what they are, and basically go through this from the bottom up. And, you know, if you've been watching the the industry press, blockchain and Bitcoin have been described as the ultimate model of distributed trust, um, the ultimate currency for transaction transparency, an entirely new world currency, and some have even said it's the biggest invention since the Internet. I don't know about yeah. that, but someone who's done a lot of work with Bitcoin and blockchain and knows an awful lot about it is our own Steve Perrino. Now, keep in mind that we are connecting to him through the the internet to Thailand, so his audio may not be top notch, but getting Steve on the line and talking to him about this is well worth a few pops and cracks. So, Steve. So, Bitcoin has only been around for eight years, and if we back nine years, at the end of 2008, we were right in the depths of the Great Recession, oh, yes. and the faith in financial institutions and central banks and money center banks and fiat currency even was at an all-time low. Banks were dropping like those, flies, in fact. Banks and brokerage houses and giant insurance companies being bailed out to hundreds of billions of dollars by the U.S. government. And at that in November of 2008, a paper from one or more fictitious persons going by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto appeared for a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, which is now known as Bitcoin. Mm. That is the title of their paper, right? Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Yes. And just the abstract of this paper does a pretty good job of explaining everything uh, about Bitcoin and blockchain and in order to to start at the the beginning at the most basic of facts we're going to go through this abstract and tell you what it really means yeah in fact you know when you read the abstract it is startling how practical and explicit it is about what the paper is espousing Yes, And the paper itself continues to be a reference material for those interested in cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, and blockchain. So it's probably a good idea to just read through the abstract. Steve, can you take us through that? Go through it in sure. bite-sized bite chunks. Be happy to do that. And it's interesting to note that at that time there were some ideas that had been proposed and a number of uh, technology ideas were brought together in this paper, and uh, we'll uncover some of the breakthroughs as we go through the abstract. So it starts out as a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments. So what do we mean here by peer-to-peer? -peer? It ends up that we're talking about something that can be across the network and it has to be recorded somewhere. So it's recorded in a ledger. And we're used to centralized ledgers at the banks that hold our checking accounts. This is a peer-to-peer, -peer, and so the ledger itself is distributed. Now, peer-to-peer -peer also indicates that all nodes in the network, so to say, are all equal. The idea here is that, that anyone can join the network and can potentially contribute to the ledger. Now, the second part of this sentence uh, would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. And a financial institution means a bank, but it also means someone like PayPal, 
who's acting as a financial institution. So the financial institution is being taken out of this, out of the equation. In fact, really, any third party is taken out. Uh, any third party can be taken out in principle, although third parties can are still allowed to play a role. The point of this is to disintermediate all of these third parties. And why is that? What do financial institutions have? Uh, they are basically the centralized points of trust. Mm -hmm. So if I want to send a check to Dan, which I rarely want to do, uh, hasn't, hasn't happened got, yet. It's, it's got to go to his bank where he deposits it and then through the Federal Reserve clearing system or the system through those centralized points of trust in the current an financial escrow system. Of some sort, right? It's an escrow of some sort. Uh, oh, overnight but it's just to make money sure market that settlement. The two sides of the transaction are, are, are confident that they're getting what they expect to get. Yes, exactly. So now this paper poses a distributed way of achieving that. Yes, and we're going to get into that now, as we go through. So let's hit the next part of this. Uh, digital signatures provide part of the solution, but the main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required to present to prevent double spending. We propose okay, so two things so, jump out at me. Okay, what One jumps is out? Digital signatures. Digital signatures implies cryptology, and mm -hmm. double spending indicates the specific problem that is at the heart of this distributed and even undistributed ways of doing this let me pull transaction. It let me pull it together, together for you even better with the next sentence. So we'll talk about these two sentences together. We propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network. So we bring peer-to-peer -peer back in again. No, over, no overarching third party. Right. So what we're saying here is that the network has to be able to handle digital signatures and it has to prevent double spending. Now, I think people are pretty familiar with the idea of digital signatures and have a general understanding of the public key, private key, cryptography methods that are used for that. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies certainly use those sorts of signatures. So that's a little bit familiar. What's a bit more abstract and less familiar is how do you prevent the double spending problem across a distributed ledger? Ah, and we're going to hit that in the very next section, which I will read for us now. The network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hash-based proof-of-work, forming a record that cannot be changed without redoing the proof-of-work. So a lot of words so that are introduced here. So um, what, I, what I really want to understand on this is that uh, the network timestamps I get uh, hashing them into an ongoing chain, I understand. Maybe it's a quick reminder that hashing takes any arbitrary length text and produces a fixed text. So it's kind of used to shrink something. But really, proof of work is the part that I think, for me, requires explanation. What do we mean exactly by proof of work? And what do we mean by once you form a record, you cannot redo it without, you know, you cannot change it without redoing the proof of work? Without redoing yes. all the previous proof of work. Yeah, but what do we mean by proof of work? What work? Mm. So let's talk about proof of work. So that is probably the newest term that's introduced in this sentence. And this sentence can be compacted to something like you add transactions into the distributed ledger only by doing proof of work. And as part of that, there's some hashing going on. So what is proof of work? Proof of work is really the requirement for nodes on the network to solve some sort of cryptographic problem that is coupled to this hashing that was mentioned and is coupled to the transactions. Proof of work uh, essentially allows you to commit the transactions in a block as being the, the one true and honest copy, and then those blocks get 
chain together and the chaining also happens as part of the proof of work. But is proof of work just a computational obstacle that is put in front of validating and locking a block of transactions? Is that all it is or is it actually doing something else? A proof of work as it's implemented in the protocols described here does uh, two things. One is that it, it validates the transactions and puts them, stamps them into the ledger indelibly. And the second is that it provides a, a reward mechanism for the entity, the compute farm or the compute pool that actually validates the transaction. And that reward mechanism is the Bitcoin itself. So Bitcoins are provided to the successful uh, achievement of proof of work. And then the transaction by being put into that block and the work is super encrypted and locked into a block and the block is locked in with other blocks. Yes, uh, the encryption happens with, with hashing. Mm -hmm. So all of the transactions are hashed together and the chaining happens by taking the hash from the old block and putting that into the mix. So it becomes part of the new hash. Okay. The new hash being a cryptographic contraction of all of the information. Uh, say that sentence again. You dropped. You broke up. The new, the new hash being a, a cryptographic contraction or coding of all of the information within the block. Gotcha. Now, the next part of this goes into a little bit more detail what we were just talking about. The longest chain not only serves as proof of the sequence of events witnessed, so all of the transactions, but proof that it came from the largest pool of CPU power. As long as the majority of CPU power is controlled by nodes that are not cooperating to attack the network, they'll generate the longest chain and outpace attackers. So the, the chain is the chain of blocks that are chained together as the hash of block zero is now included in the hashing process for block one. And what happens is all of the miners, and I'm introducing a new term there, but the miners are the computers that are doing proof of work. All of those miners are attempting to solve the cryptographic problem in parallel. Only one of them reaches the solution first. And as it does that, it broadcasts its solution and it adds that block onto the chain. And so the ledger that it holds is now the longest chain. Mm -hmm. So what is interesting is that uh, it's not like everybody on the network gets to have one vote because they're on the network. Uh, everybody with a CPU gets to have a vote, assuming they are willing to dedicate that CPU to do all the proof-of-work computationally intensive things. So if the largest pool of CPUs has to vote to create that validation, then there is this direct link between the longest chain and the largest pool of CPU power. And if you have a large pool of CPU power and you could do this work and make money doing it, then maybe it behooves you to do that instead of using that to like hijack the network. Am I getting it? You are getting it. It's kind of a lottery system. And so, you know, the more computers you throw at it, the more chances you have of solving the problem and earning the reward. And most of the actors are assumed to be honest actors. And if you wanted to disrupt the honest chain, you would need more CPU power than uh, need more than everyone half. else combined. So that is, you would need 51% of the compute power as a dishonest actor. And in fact, it becomes tougher than that, but we can defer that discussion. Right, because if I'm, yeah, okay, we can, let's go back to the abstract. Okay, back to the abstract. Next part of it is the network. In fact, this is the last part of it. 
The network itself requires minimal structure. Messages are broadcast on a best efforts basis, and nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will, accepting the longest proof of work chain as proof of what happened while they were gone. So if, if Dan takes his uh, supercomputer offline and he comes back the next day, he just picks up the proof of work chain and assumes it's good. That makes sense. Because we know that you know, all the right. blocks have been generated and validated and, and different pools are, are validating the blocks. So once you get five, five or six blocks on the chain, then the old blocks are very high probability of being valid. Right. And if you want to like hijack a particular transaction, there have been a lot of other transactions in the meantime, and you have to redo all of those too, in order you have to roll back the chain and then build it you back up, and that becomes more and more computationally difficult, right? Right. That's exponentially difficult. And so you'd have to go back half a dozen blocks and try to outrace everybody while they're still adding new blocks, and you could never catch up. That's a good system, and that's what is Excellent. preventing counterfeiting and uh, general mischief. All right. Now, I, I suggest that... Uh, you know, reread the entire abstract because I think that abstract pretty much sums it all up really nicely and explicitly. And maybe we can come back and drill down into different aspects of it. Sure. Let's run through the whole thing again. Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. A purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be set directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. Digital signatures provide part of the solution, but the main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required to, present, to prevent double spending. We propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network. The network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hash-based proof-of-work, forming a record that cannot be changed without redoing the proof-of-work. The longest chain not only serves as proof of the sequence of events witnessed, but proof that it came from the largest pool of CPU power. As long as, the, as a majority of CPU power is controlled by nodes that are not cooperating to attack the network, they'll generate the longest chain and outpace attackers. The network itself requires minimal structure. Messages are broadcast on a best efforts basis, and nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will, accepting the longest proof-of-work chain as proof of what happened while they were gone. That sort of says it all. Excellent. Excellent. Yes, it, it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty dense uh, set of uh, sentences, because every sentence introduces a bunch of concepts, and they are at the core of what makes this thing work. Yes. Excellent. So, and, and for those that want to read the paper, it's a pretty dense paper, only nine pages in, in length. So we encourage you to do that as well. But you may not need to do that because in future shows, we're going to be going through basically cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, A to Z. We're going to be talking about what is money, how money as we know it today uh, compares and contrasts to cryptocurrency, how cryptocurrency can be used etc etc so that'll be in our next shows uh thank you guys i want to thank you guys for coming in and and uh providing so much explanation to this until next episode thank you yes and You're welcome dan and we Thanks. will talk to you both again in our next episode where we delve deeper into bitcoin and cryptocurrencies